Chapter Five of the D'Artagnan Romances, Volume One: The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas, translated by William Robson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The King's Musketeers and the Cardinal's Guards. D'Artagnan was acquainted with nobody in Paris. He went therefore to his appointment with Athos without a second, determined to be satisfied with those his adversary should choose. Besides, his intention was formed to make the brave musketeer all suitable apologies, but without meanness or weakness, fearing that might result from this duel which generally results from an affair of this kind, when a young and vigorous man fights with an adversary who is wounded and weakened. If conquered, he doubles the triumph of his antagonist. If a conqueror, he is accused of foul play and want of courage. Now, we must have badly painted the character of our adventure-seeker, or our readers must have already perceived that D'Artagnan was not an ordinary man. Therefore, while repeating to himself that his death was inevitable, he did not make up his mind to die quietly, as one less courageous and less restrained might have done in his place. He reflected upon the different characters of those with whom he was going to fight, and began to view his situation more clearly. He hoped by means of loyal excuses to make a friend of Athos, whose lordly air and austere bearing pleased him much. He flattered himself he should be able to frighten Porthos with the adventure of the baldric, which he might, if not killed upon the spot, relate to everybody a recital which, well managed, would cover Porthos with ridicule. As to the astute Aramis, he did not entertain much dread of him, and supposing he should be able to get so far, he determined to dispatch him in a good style, or at least, by hitting him in the face, as Caesar recommended his soldiers do to those of Pompey, to damage forever the beauty of which he was so proud. In addition to this, D'Artagnan possessed that invincible stock of resolution, which the counsels of his father had implanted in his heart. "'Endure nothing from any one but the king, the cardinal, and Monsieur de Treville.' He flew, rather than walked, toward the convent of the Carme de Chaussée, or rather de Chaux, as it was called at that period, a sort of building without a window, surrounded by barren fields, an accessory to the Prue clerks, and which was generally employed as the place for the duels of men who had no time to lose. When D'Artagnan arrived in sight of the bare spot of ground, which extended along the foot of the monastery, Athos had been waiting for five minutes, and twelve o'clock was striking. He was then as punctual as the Samaritan woman, and the most rigorous casuist with regard to duels could have nothing to say. Athos, who still suffered grievously from his wound, though it had been dressed anew by M. de Treville's surgeon, was seated on a post and waiting for his adversary with hat in hand, his feather even touching the ground. Monsieur, said Athos, I have engaged two of my friends as seconds, but these two friends are not yet come, at which I am astonished, as it is not at all their custom. I have no seconds on my part, monsieur, said D'Artagnan, for having only arrived yesterday in Paris, I as yet know no one but monsieur de Treville, to whom I was recommended by my father, who has the honor to be in some degree one of his friends. Athos reflected for an instant. "'You know no one but Monsieur de Treville?' he asked. "'Yes, monsieur, I only know him.' "'Well, but then,' continued Athos, speaking half to himself, "'if I kill you, I shall have the air of a boy-slayer.' Uh, "'Not too much so,' replied D'Artagnan, with a bow that was not deficient in dignity. "'Since you do me the honor to draw a sword with me "'while suffering from a wound which is very inconvenient.' "'Very inconvenient, upon my word. "'And you hurt me devilishly, I can tell you. "'But I will take the left hand. "'It is my custom in such circumstances. "'Do not fancy that I do you a favor. "'I use either hand easily, "'and it will be a disadvantage to you.' A left-handed man is very troublesome to people who are not prepared for it. I regret I did not inform you sooner of this circumstance. "'You have truly, monsieur,' said D'Artagnan, bowing again, "'a courtesy for which I assure you I am very grateful.' "'You confuse me,' 
replied Athos with his gentlemanly air. Let us talk of something else, if you please. Ah, Splud, how you have hurt me! My shoulder quite burns. If you would permit me, said D'Artagnan with timidity. What, monsieur? I have a miraculous balsam for wounds, a balsam given to me by my mother, and of which I have made a trial upon myself. Well? Well, I am sure that in less than three days this balsam would cure you, and at the end of three days, when you would be cured, well, sir, it would still do me a great honor to be your man. D'Artagnan spoke these words with a simplicity that did honor to his courtesy, without throwing the least doubt upon his courage. Pardieu, monsieur, said Athos, that's a proposition that pleases me, not that I can accept it, but a league of its savors of the gentlemen. Thus spoke and acted the gallant knights of the time of Charlemagne, in whom every cavalier ought to seek his model. Unfortunately, we do not live in the times of the great emperor, we live in the times of the cardinal. And three days hence, however, well, the secret might be guarded, it would be known. I say, that we were to fight and our combat would be prevented. I think these fellows will never come. If you are in haste, monsieur, said D'Artagnan, with the same simplicity with which a moment before he had proposed to him to put off the duel for three days, and if it be your will to dispatch me at once, do not inconvenience yourself, I pray you. There is another word which pleases me, cried Athos, with a gracious nod to D'Artagnan. That did not come from a man without a heart. Monsieur, I love men of your kidney, and I foresee plainly that if we don't kill each other, I should hereafter have much pleasure in your conversation. We will wait for these gentlemen, so please you. I have plenty of time, and it will be more correct. Ah, here is one of them, I believe. In fact, at the end of the Rue Vaugigard, the gigantic Porthos appeared. What? cried D'Artagnan. Is your first witness Monsieur Porthos? Yes, that disturbs you. By no means. And here is the second. D'Artagnan turned in the direction pointed to by Athos and perceived Aramis. What? cried he in an accent of greater astonishment than before. Your second witness is Monsieur Aramis. Doubtless. Are you not aware that we are never seen one without the others, and that we are called among the musketeers and the guards, at court and in the city, Athos, Porthos, and Aramis, or the three inseparables? And yet, as you come from Dax or Pau, from Tarbes, said D'Artagnan, it is probable you are ignorant of this little fact, said Athos. My faith, replied D'Artagnan, you are well-named gentlemen, and my adventure, if it should make any noise, will prove at least that your union is not founded upon contrasts. In the meantime, Porthos had come up, waved his hand to Athos, and then turning toward D'Artagnan, stood quite astonished. Let us say in passing that he changed his baldric and relinquished his cloak. Ha, 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 said he. What does this mean? This is the gentleman I am going to fight with, said Athos, pointing to D'Artagnan with his hand and saluting him with the same gesture. Why, it is with him I am also going to fight, said Porthos. But not before one o'clock replied d'artagnan but i also am to fight with this gentleman said aramis coming in his turn into the place but not until two o'clock said d'artagnan with the same calmness but what are you going to fight about athos asked aramis faith i don't very well know he hurt my shoulder and you porthos faith i am going to fight because i am going to fight answered porthos reddening athos whose keen eye lost nothing perceived a faintly sly smile pass over the lips of the young gascon as he replied we had a short discussion upon dress 
"'And you, Aramis?' asked Athos. "'Oh, ours is a theological quarrel,' replied Aramis, making a sign to D'Artagnan to keep secret the cause of their duel. Athos indeed saw a second smile on the lips of D'Artagnan. "'Indeed?' said Athos. "'Yes, a passage of St. Augustine upon which we could not agree,' said the Gascon. "'Decidedly, this is a clever fellow,' murmured Athos. "'And now you are assembled, gentlemen,' said D'Artagnan. "'Permit me to offer you my apologies.' At this word apologies, a cloud passed over the brow of Athos. A haughty smile curled the lip of Porthos and a negative sign was the reply of Aramis. "'You do not understand me, gentlemen,' said D'Artagnan, throwing up his head, the sharp and bold lines of which were at the moment gilded by a bright ray of the sun. "'I asked to be excused in case I should not be able to discharge my debt to all three, for Monsieur Athos has the right to kill me first, which must much diminish the face value of your bill, Monsieur Porthos.' and render yours almost null, Monsieur Aramis. And now, gentlemen, I repeat, excuse me, but on that account only, and on guard. At these words, with the most gallant air possible, D'Artagnan drew his sword. The blood had mounted to the head of D'Artagnan, and at that moment he would have drawn his sword against all the musketeers in the kingdom as willingly as he now did against Athos, Porthos, and Aramis. It was a quarter past midday, the sun was in its zenith, and the spot chosen for the scene of the duel was exposed to its full ardor. "'It is very hot,' said Athos, drawing his sword in its turn. "'And yet I cannot take off my doublet, for I just now felt my wound begin to bleed again, and I should not like to annoy Monsieur with the sight of blood, which he has not drawn from me himself.' "'That is true, Monsieur,' replied D'Artagnan and whether drawn by myself or another, I assure you I shall always view with regret the blood of so brave a gentleman. I will therefore fight in my doublet like yourself. "'Come, come, enough of such compliments,' cried Porthos. "'Remember, we are waiting for our turns.' "'Speak for yourself when you are inclined to utter such incongruities,' interrupted Aramis. "'For my part, I think what they say is very well said.' and quite worthy of two gentlemen. "'When you please, monsieur,' said Athos, putting himself on guard. "'I waited your orders,' said D'Artagnan, crossing swords. But scarcely had the two rapiers clashed, when a company of the guards of his eminence, commanded by Monsieur de Jussac, turned the corner of the convent. "'The cardinal's guards!' cried Aramis and Porthos at the same time. "'Sheath your swords, gentlemen! Sheath your swords!' But it was too late. The two combatants had been seen in a position which left no doubt of their intentions. "'Hello!' cried Jussac, advancing toward them and making a sign to his men to do so likewise. "'Hello! Musketeers! Fighting here, are you? And the edicts? <laughs> what has become of them?' "'You are very generous, gentlemen of the guards,' said Athos, full of rancor, for Jussac was one of the aggressors of the preceding day. If we were to see you fighting, I can assure you that we would make no effort to prevent you. Leave us alone, then, and you will enjoy a little amusement without cost to yourselves. Gentlemen, said Jussac, it is with great regret that I pronounce the thing impossible. Duty before everything. Sheath, then, if you please, and follow us. Monsieur, said Aramis, parodying Jussac, it would afford us great pleasure to obey your polite invitation, if it depended upon ourselves. But unfortunately, the thing is impossible. Monsieur de Treville has forbidden it. Pass on your way, then. It is the best thing to do. This raillery exasperated Jussac. We will charge upon you, then, said he, if you disobey. There are five of them, said Athos half aloud. And we are but three. We shall be beaten again, and must die on the spot. For on my part I declare I will never appear again before the captain as a conquered man." Athos, Porthos, and Aramis instantly drew near one another, while Jussac drew up his soldiers. 
This short interval was sufficient to determine D'Artagnan on the part he was to take. It was one of those events which decide the life of a man. It was a choice between the king and the cardinal. The choice made, it must be persisted in. To fight, that was to disobey the law. That was to risk his head. That was to make at one blow an enemy of a minister more powerful than the king himself. All this the young man perceived, and yet, to his praise we speak it, he did not hesitate a second. Turning toward Athos and his friends, Gentlemen, said he, allow me to correct your words, if you please. You said you were but three, but it appears to me we are four. But you are not one of us, said Porthos. That's true, replied D'Artagnan. I have not the uniform, but I have the spirit. My heart is that of a musketeer. I feel it, monsieur, and that impels me on. "'Withdraw, young man!' cried Jussac, whose doubtless, by his gestures and the expression of his countenance, had guessed D'Artagnan's design. "'You may retire. We consent to that. Save your skin. Be gone quickly!' D'Artagnan did not budge. "'Decidedly, you are a brave fellow,' said Athos, pressing the young man's hand. "'Come, come, choose your part,' replied Jussac. Well, said Porthos to Aramis, we must do something. Monsieur is full of generosity, said Athos, but all three reflected upon the youth of D'Artagnan and dreaded his inexperience. We should only be three, one of whom is wounded with the addition of a boy, resumed Athos, and yet it will not be the less said we were four men. Yes but to yield said porthos that is difficult replied athos d'artagnan comprehended their irresolution try me gentlemen said he and i swear to you by my honor that i will not go hence if we are conquered what is your name my brave fellow said athos d'artagnan monsieur well then athos porthos aramis and d'artagnan forward cried athos come gentlemen have you decided cried jussac for the third time it is done gentlemen said athos and what is your choice asked jussac we are about to have the honor of charging you replied aramis lifting his hat with one hand and drawing his sword with the other ha you resist do you splud does that astonish you and the nine combatants rushed upon each other, with a fury which, however, did not exclude a certain degree of method. Athos fixed upon a certain Cuisac, a favorite of the cardinals, Porthos had Bicarat, and Aramis found himself opposed to two adversaries. As to D'Artagnan, he sprang toward Jussac himself. The heart of the young Gascon beat as if it would burst through his side. Not from fear, God be thanked, he had not the shade of it, but with emulation he fought like a furious tiger turning ten times round his adversary and changing his ground and his guard twenty times jussac was as was then said a fine blade and had had much practice nevertheless it required all his skill to defend himself against an adversary who active and energetic departed every instant from received rules attacking him on all sides at once and yet parrying like a man who had the greatest respect for his own epidermis. This contest at length exhausted Jussac's patience. Furious at being held in check by one whom he had considered a boy, he became warm and began to make mistakes. D'Artagnan, who, though wanting in practice, had a sound theory, redoubled his agility. Jussac, anxious to put an end to this, springing forward aimed a terrible thrust at his adversary, but the latter parried it, and while Jussac was recovering himself, glided like a serpent beneath his blade and passed his sword through his body. Jussac fell like a dead mass. D'Artagnan then cast an anxious and rapid glance over the battlefield. Aramis had killed one of his adversaries, but the other pressed him warmly. Nevertheless, Aramis was in a good situation and able to defend himself. Bicarat and Porthos had just made counter-hits, Porthos had received a thrust through his arm, and Bicarat one through his thigh. 
but neither of these two wounds was serious, and they only fought more earnestly. Athos, wounded anew by a cuissac, became evidently paler, but did not give way a foot. He only changed his sword hand and fought with his left hand. According to the laws of dueling at the period, D'Artagnan was at liberty to assist whom he pleased. While he was endeavoring to find out which of his companions stood in greatest need, he caught a glance from Athos. The glance was of sublime eloquence. Athos would have died rather than appeal for help, but he could look, and with that look ask assistance. D'Artagnan interpreted it. With a terrible bound, he sprang to the side of Cahusac, crying, "'To me, monsieur guardsman, I will slay you!' Cusac turned around. It was time for Athos, whose great courage alone supported him, sank upon his knee. Splut, cried he to D'Artagnan, "'do not kill him, young man. I beg of you. I have an old affair to settle with him when I am cured and sound again. Disarm him only. Make sure of his sword.' that's it very well done the exclamation was drawn from athos by seeing the sword of cahusac fly twenty paces from him d'artagnan and cahusac sprang forward at the same instant the one to recover the other to obtain the sword but d'artagnan being the more active reached it first and placed his foot upon it cahusac immediately ran to the guardsman whom aramis had killed seized his rapier and returned toward d'artagnan but on his way he met athos who during his relief which d'artagnan had procured him had recovered his breath and who for fear that d'artagnan would kill his enemy wished to resume the fight d'artagnan perceived that it would be disobliging athos not to leave him alone and in a few minutes cahusac fell with a sword thrust through his throat at the same instant aramis placed his sword point on the breast of his fallen enemy and forced him to ask for mercy there only then remained porthos and bicarat Porthos made a thousand flourishes, asking Bicarat what o'clock it could be, and offering him his compliments upon his brothers, having just obtained a company in the regiment of Navarre. But, just as he might, he gained nothing. Bicarat was one of those iron men who never fell dead. Nevertheless, it was necessary to finish. The watch might come up and take all the combatants, wounded or not, royalist or cardinalist. Athos and Aramis and D'Artagnan surrounded Bicarat, and required him to surrender. Though alone against all and with a wound in his thigh, Bicarat wished to hold out. But Chassac, who had risen upon his elbow, cried out to him to yield. Bicarat was a Gascon, and D'Artagnan was. He turned a deaf ear and contented himself with laughing, and between two Paris finding time to point to a spot of earth with his sword. Here, cried he, parodying a verse of the Bible, here will Bicarat die for I am only left, and they seek my life. But there are four against you. Leave off, I command you. Ah, if you command me, that's another thing, said Bicarat. As you are my commander, it is my duty to obey. And springing backward, he broke his sword across his knee to avoid the necessity of surrendering it, threw the pieces over the convent wall, and crossed him arms, whistling a cardinalist air. Bravery is always respected, even in an enemy. The musketeers saluted Bicarat with their swords and returned them to their sheaths. D'Artagnan did the same. Then, assisted by Bicarat, the only one left standing, they bore Jussac, Cahusac, and one of Aramis's adversaries who was only wounded, under the porch of the convent. The fourth, as we have said, was dead. They then rang the bell, and carrying away four swords out of five, they took their road, intoxicated with joy, toward the hotel of Monsieur de Treville. They walked arm in arm, occupying the whole width of the street and taking in every musketeer they met, so that in the end it became a triumphal march. The heart of D'Artagnan swam in delirium. He marched between Athos and Porthos, pressing them tenderly. "'If I am not yet a musketeer,' said he to his new friends as he passed through the gateway of Monsieur de Treville's hotel, "'at least I have entered upon my apprenticeship, haven't I?' End of chapter 5. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 6 of the D'Artagnan Romances, Volume 1. The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas, translated by William Robson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. His Majesty King Louis the Thirteenth. 
This affair made a great noise. Monsieur de Treville scolded his musketeers in public and congratulated them in private. But as no time was to be lost in gaining the king, Monsieur de Treville hastened to report himself at the Louvre. It was already too late. The king was closeted with the cardinal, and Monsieur de Treville was informed that the king was busy and could not receive him at that moment. In the evening, Monsieur de Treville attended the king's gaming table. The king was winning, and as he was very avaricious, he was in an excellent humor. Perceiving Monsieur de Treville at a distance, "'Come here, Monsieur Captain,' said he. "'Come here that I may growl at you. Do you know that his eminence has been making fresh complaints against your musketeers, and that with so much emotion that this evening his eminence is indisposed?' Ah, these musketeers of yours are very devils, fellows to be hanged. No, sire, replied Treville, who saw at the first glance how things would go. On the contrary, they are good creatures, as meek as lambs, and have but one desire, I'll be their warranty, and that is that their swords may never leave their scabbards, but in your majesty's service. But what are they to do? The guards of Monsieur the Cardinal are forever seeking quarrels with them, and for the honor of the corps even. The poor young men are obliged to defend themselves. "'Listen to Monsieur de Treville,' said the king. "'Listen to him. Would not one say he was speaking of a religious community? In truth, my dear captain, I have a great mind to take away your commission and give it to Mademoiselle de Chemerault, to whom I promised an abbé. But don't fancy that I am going to take you on your bare word— I am called Louis the Just, Monsieur de Treville, and by and by, by and by, we will see. Ah, sire, it is because I confide in that justice that I shall wait patiently and quietly the good pleasure of your majesty. Wait then, monsieur, wait, said the king. I will not detain you long. In fact, fortune changed, and as the king began to lose what he had won, he was not sorry to find an excuse for playing Charlemagne, if we may use a gaming phrase of whose origin we confess our ignorance. The king, therefore, rose a minute after, and putting the money which lay before him into his pocket, the major part of which arose from his winnings, "'La Vuville, said he, "'take my place. I must speak to Monsieur de Treville on an affair of importance. Ah, I had eighty louis before me. Put down the same sum, so that they who have lost may have nothing to complain of. Justice before everything. Then turning toward Monsieur de Treville, and walking with him toward the embrasure of a window. Well, monsieur, continued he, you say it is his eminence guards who have sought a quarrel with your musketeers? Yes, sire, as they always do. And how did the thing happen? Let us see, for you know, my dear captain— a judge must hear both sides. Good Lord! In the most simple and natural manner possible, three of my best soldiers, whom your majesty knows by name, and whose devotedness you have more than once appreciated, and who have, I dare affirm to the king, his service much at heart, three of my best soldiers, I say, Athos, Porthos, and Aramis, had made a party of pleasure with a young fellow from Gascony, whom I had introduced to them the same morning. The party was to take place at St. Germain, I believe, and they had appointed to meet at the Calme des Chaux when they were disturbed by de Jussac, Cahuzac Becquerot, and two other guardsmen, who certainly did not go there in such a numerous company without some ill intention against the edicts. Ah, <laughs> you incline me to think so, said the king. There is no doubt they went thither to fight themselves. I do not accuse them, sire, but I leave your majesty to judge what five armed men could possibly be going to do in such a deserted place as the neighborhood of the convent de Carmes. Yes, you are right, Treville. You are right. Then, upon seeing my musketeers, they changed their minds and forgot their private hatred for partisan hatred for your majesty cannot be ignorant that the musketeers, who belong to the king and nobody but the king, are the natural enemies of the guardsmen who belong to the cardinal. 
Yes, Treville, yes, said the king in a melancholy tone. And it is very sad, believe me, to see thus two parties in France, two heads to royalty. But all this will come to an end, Treville, will come to an end. You say, then, that the guardsmen sought a quarrel with the musketeers? I say that it is probable that things have fallen out so, but I will not swear to it, sire. You know how difficult it is to discover the truth, unless a man be endowed with that admirable instinct which causes Louis the Thirteenth to be named the Just. You are right, Treville, but they were not alone, your musketeers. They had a youth with them. Yes, sire, and one wounded man, so that three of the king's musketeers, one of whom was wounded, and a youth, not only maintained their ground against five of the most terrible of the cardinal's guardsmen, but absolutely brought four of them to earth. Why, this is a victory, cried the king, all radiant. A complete victory. Yes, sire, as complete as that of the bridge of Say. Four men, one of them wounded, and a youth, say you? One hardly a young man, but who, however, behaved himself so admirably on this occasion that I will take the liberty of recommending him to your majesty. How does he call himself? D'Artagnan, sire. He is the son of one of my oldest friends, the son of a man who served under the king your father, of glorious memory in the civil war and you say this young man behaved himself well tell me how treville you know how i delight in accounts of war and fighting and louis the thirteenth twisted his mustache proudly placing his hand upon his hip sire resumed treville as i told you monsieur d'artagnan is little more than a boy and as he has not the honor of being a musketeer, he was dressed as a citizen. The guards of the cardinal, perceiving this youth, and that he did not belong to the corps, invited him to retire before they attacked. So you may plainly see, Treville, interrupted the king, it was they who attacked. That is true, sire. There can be no more doubt on that head. They called upon him then to retire, but he answered that he was a musketeer at heart, entirely devoted to your majesty, and that therefore he would remain with messieurs the musketeers. Brave young man, murmured the king. Well, he did remain with them, and your majesty has in him so firm a champion that it was he who gave Jussac the terrible sword thrust which has made the cardinal so angry. He who wounded Jussac, cried the king. He, a boy, Treville, that's impossible. It is as I have the honor to relate it to your majesty. Jussac, one of the first swordsmen in the kingdom. Well, sire, for once he found his master. I will see this young man, Treville. I will see him, and if anything can be done, well, we will make it our business. When will your majesty deign to receive him? Tomorrow, at midday, Treville. Shall I bring him alone? No, bring me all four together. I wish to thank them all at once. Devoted men are so rare, Treville. By the back staircase, it is useless to let the cardinal know. Yes, sire. You understand, Treville. An edict is still an edict. It is forbidden to fight, after all. But this encounter, sire, is quite out of the ordinary conditions of a duel. It is a brawl, and the proof is that there were five of the cardinal's guardsmen against my three musketeers and Monsieur d'Artagnan. That is true, said the king. But never mind, Treville. Come still by the back staircase. Treville smiled, but as it was indeed something to have prevailed upon this child to rebel against his master, he saluted the king respectfully, and with this agreement took leave of him. 
That evening the three musketeers were informed of the honor accorded them. As they had long been acquainted with the king, they were not much excited, but D'Artagnan, with his Gascon imagination, saw in it his future fortune, and passed the night in golden dreams. By eight o'clock in the morning he was at the apartment of Athos. D'Artagnan found the musketeer dressed and ready to go out. As the hour to wait upon the king was not till twelve, he had made a party with Porthos and Aramis to play a game at tennis in a tennis court situated near the stables of Le Luxembourg. Athos invited D'Artagnan to follow them, and although ignorant of the game, which he had never played, he accepted not knowing what to do with his time from nine o'clock in the morning, as it was then scarcely was, till twelve. The two musketeers were already there and were playing together. Athos, who was very expert in all bodily exercises, passed with D'Artagnan to the opposite side and challenged them. But at the first effort he made, although he played with his left hand, he found that his wound was yet too recent to allow of such exertion. D'Artagnan remained therefore alone, and as he declared he was too ignorant of the game to play it regularly, they only continued giving balls to one another without counting. But one of these balls, launched by Porthos's Herculean hand, passed so close to D'Artagnan's face that he thought that if instead of passing near it had hit him, his audience would have been probably lost, as it would have been impossible for him to present himself before the king. Now, as upon this audience in his Gascon imagination depended his future life, he saluted Aramis and Porthos politely, declaring that he would not resume the game until he should be prepared to play with them on more equal terms, and went to took his place near the cord and in the gallery. Unfortunately for D'Artagnan, among the spectators was one of the eminence's guardsmen, who, still irritated by the defeat of his companions, which had happened only the day before, had promised himself to seize the first opportunity of avenging it. He believed this opportunity was now come and addressed his neighbor. "'It is not astonishing that that young man should be afraid of a ball, for he is doubtless a musketeer apprentice.' D'Artagnan turned round as if a serpent had stung him, and fixed his eyes intensely upon the guardsman who had just made this insolent speech. "'Pardieu,' resumed the latter, twisting his mustache, "'look at me as long as you like, my little gentleman. I have said what I have said.' And as since that which you have said is too clear to require any explanation, replied D'Artagnan in a low voice, I beg you to follow me. And when? asked the guardsman with the same jeering air. At once, if you please. And you know who I am without doubt? I, I am completely ignorant, nor does it much disquiet me. You are in the wrong there, for if you knew my name... Perhaps you would not be so pressing. What is your name? Bernajou, at your service. Well, then, Monsieur Bernajou, said D'Artagnan tranquilly, I will wait for you at the door. Go, Monsieur, I will follow you. Do not hurry yourself, Monsieur, lest it be observed that we go out together. You must be aware that for our undertaking company would be in the way. That's true, said the guardsman astonished that his name had not produced more effect upon the young man. Indeed, the name of Bernajou was known to all the world, D'Artagnan alone excepted, perhaps for it was one of those which figured most frequently in the daily brawls which all the edicts of the cardinal could not repress. Porthos and Aramis were so engaged with their game, and Athos was watching them with so much attention, that they did not even perceive their young companion go out, who— as he had told the guardsman of his eminence, stopped outside the door. An instant after, the guardsman descended in his turn. As D'Artagnan had no time to lose on account of the audience of the king, which was fixed for midday, he cast his eyes around, and seeing that the street was empty, said to his adversary, "'My faith! It is fortunate for you, although your name is Bernajou, to have only to deal with an apprentice musketeer. Never mind. Be content. I will do my best.' on guard. But, said he whom D'Artagnan thus provoked, it appears to me that this place is badly chosen, and that we should be better behind the Abbey St. Germain or in the pre aux clerc <sighs> What you say is full of sense, replied D'Artagnan. 
but unfortunately I have very little time to spare, having an appointment at twelve precisely. On guard, then, monsieur, on guard. Bernajou was not a man to have such a compliment paid to him twice. In an instant his sword glittered in his hand, and he sprang upon his adversary, whom, thanks to his great youthfulness, he hoped to intimidate. But D'Artagnan had, on the preceding day, served his apprenticeship. Fresh, sharpened by his victory, full of hopes of future favor, he was resolved not to recoil a step. So the two swords were crossed close to the hilts, and as D'Artagnan stood firm, it was his adversary who made the retreating step. But D'Artagnan seized the moment at which, in this movement, the sword of Bernajou deviated from the line. He freed his weapon, made a lunge, and touched his adversary on the shoulder. D'Artagnan immediately made a step backward and raised his sword, but Bernajou cried out that it was nothing, and rushing blindly upon him, absolutely spitted himself upon D'Artagnan's sword. As, however, he did not fall, as he did not declare himself conquered, but only broke away toward the hotel of Monsieur de la Tremouille, in whose service he had a relative, D'Artagnan was ignorant of the seriousness of the last wound his adversary had received, and pressing him warmly, without doubt, would soon have completed his work with a third blow, when the noise which arose from the street being heard in the tennis court, two of the friends of the guardsman who had seen him go out after exchanging some words with D'Artagnan, rushed sword in hand from the court, and fell upon the conqueror. But Athos, Porthos, and Aramis quickly appeared in their turn, and the moment the two guardsmen attacked their young companion, drove them back. Bernajou now fell, and as the guardsmen were only two against four, they began to cry, "'To the rescue! The Hotel de la Tremouille!' At these cries, all who were in the hotel rushed out and fell upon the four companions, who on their side cried aloud, "'To the rescue! Musketeers!' This cry was generally heeded, for the musketeers were known to be enemies of the cardinal, and were beloved on account of the hatred they bore to his eminence. Thus the soldiers of other companies than those which belonged to the Red Duke, as Aramis had called him, often took part with the king's musketeers in these quarrels. Of three guardsmen of the company of Monsieur de Sartre, who were passing, two came to the assistance of the four companions, while the other ran toward the hotel of Monsieur de Treville, crying, "'To the rescue, musketeers! To the rescue!' As usual, this hotel was full of soldiers of this company, who hastened to the succor of their comrades. The melee became general, but strength was on the side of the musketeers. The cardinal's guards and Monsieur de la Tremoille's people retreated into the hotel, the doors of which they closed just in time to prevent their enemies from entering with them. As to the wounded man, he had been taken in at once, and as we have said, in a very bad state. Excitement was at its height among the musketeers and their allies, and they even began to deliberate whether they should not set fire to the hotel to punish the insolence of Monsieur de la Tremouille's domestics in daring to make a sortie upon the king's musketeers. The proposition had been made and received with enthusiasm, when fortunately eleven o'clock struck. D'Artagnan and his companions remembered their audience, and as they would very much have regretted that such an opportunity should be lost, they succeeded in calming their friends, who contented themselves with hurling some paving stones against the gates. But the gates were too strong. They soon tired of the sport. Besides, those who must be considered the leaders of the enterprise had quit the group and were making their way toward the hotel of Monsieur de Treville, who was waiting for them already informed of this fresh disturbance. "'Quick, to the Louvre,' said he. "'To the Louvre, without losing an instant, and let us endeavor to see the king before he is prejudiced by the cardinal. We will describe the thing to him as a consequence of the affair of yesterday, and the two will pass off together.' M. de Treville, accompanied by the four young fellows, directed his course toward the Louvre, but to the great astonishment of the captain of the musketeers, he was informed that the king had gone stag-hunting in the forest of Saint-Germain. M. de Treville required this intelligence to be repeated to him twice, and each time his companions saw his brow become darker. "'Had his majesty,' asked he, "'any intention of holding this hunting party yesterday?' "'No, Your Excellency,' replied the valet de chambre. "'The master of the hounds came this morning "'to inform him that he had marked down a stag. "'At first the king answered that he would not go, "'but he could not resist his love of sport "'and set out after dinner. "'And the king has seen the cardinal?' "'asked Monsieur de Treville. "'In all probability he has,' replied the valet, 
for I saw the horses harnessed to his eminence carriage this morning, and when I asked where he was going, they told me to St. Germain. He is beforehand with us, said Monsieur de Treville. Gentlemen, I will see the king this evening, but as to you, I do not advise you to risk doing so. This advice was too reasonable, and moreover came from a man who knew the king too well to allow the four young men to dispute it. M. de Treville recommended everyone to return home and wait for news. On entering his hotel, M. de Treville thought it best to be first in making the complaint. He sent one of his servants to M. de la Tremoille with a letter in which he begged of him to eject the cardinal's guardsmen from his house, and to reprimand his people for their audacity in making sortie against the king's musketeers. But M. de la Tremoille, already prejudiced by his esquire, whose relative, as we already know, Bernajou was, replied that it was neither for M. de Treville nor the musketeers to complain, but, on the contrary, for him, whose people the musketeers had assaulted, and whose hotel they had endeavored to burn. Now, as the debate between these two nobles might last a long time, each becoming naturally more firm in his own opinion, M. de Treville thought of an expedient which might terminate it quietly. This was to go himself to M. de la Tremoille. He repaired, therefore, immediately to his hotel, and caused himself to be announced. The two nobles saluted each other politely, for if no friendship existed between them, there was at least esteem. Both were men of courage and honor, and as M. de la Tremoille, a Protestant, and seeing the king seldom, was of no party, he did not in general carry any bias into his social relations. This time, however, his address, although polite, was cooler than usual. Monsieur, said M. de Treville, we fancy that we each have cause to complain of the other, and I am come to endeavor to clear up this affair. I have no objection, replied M. de la Tremoille, but I warn you that I am well informed, and all the fault is with your musketeers. You are too just and reasonable a man, monsieur, said Treville, not to accept the proposal I am about to make to you. Make it, monsieur. I listen. How is monsieur Bonajou, your esquire's relative? Why, monsieur, very ill indeed. In addition to the sword thrust in his arm, which is not dangerous, he has received another right through his lungs, of which the doctor says bad things. But has the wounded man retained his senses? Perfectly. Does he talk? With difficulty, but he can speak. Well, monsieur, let us go to him. Let us adjure him, in the name of God, before whom he must perhaps appear, to speak the truth. I will take him for judge in his own cause, monsieur, and will believe what he will say. Monsieur de la Tremoille reflected for an instant. Then, as it was difficult to suggest a more reasonable proposal, he agreed to it. Both descended to the chamber in which the wounded man lay. The latter, on seeing these two noble lords who came to visit him, endeavored to raise himself up in his bed, but he was too weak, and exhausted by the effort he fell back again almost senseless. M. de la Tremoille approached him, and made him inhale some salts which recalled him to life. Then M. de Treville, unwilling that it should be thought that he had influenced the wounded man, requested M. de la Tremoille to interrogate him himself. That happened which M. de Treville had foreseen. Placed between life and death, as Bernajou was, he had no idea for a moment of concealing the truth, and he described to the two nobles the affair exactly as it had passed. This was all that M. de Treville wanted. He wished Bernajou a speedy convalescence, took leave of M. de la Tremoille, returned to his hotel, and immediately sent word to the four friends that he awaited their company at dinner. M. de Treville entertained good company, wholly anti-cardinalist, though. It may easily be understood, therefore, that the conversation during the whole of dinner turned upon the two checks that his eminence's guardsmen had received. Now, as D'Artagnan had been the hero of these two fights, it was upon him that all the felicitations fell, which Athos, Porthos, and Aramis abandoned to him, not only as good comrades, but as men who had so often had their turn that they could very well afford him his. Toward six o'clock, M. de Treville announced that it was time to go to the Louvre. But, as the hour of audience granted by His Majesty was passed, instead of claiming the entree by the backstairs, 
he placed himself with the four young men in the antechamber. The king had not yet returned from hunting. Our young men had been waiting about half an hour amid a crowd of courtiers, when all the doors were thrown open and his majesty was announced. At his announcement, D'Artagnan felt himself tremble to the very marrow of his bones. The coming instant would in all probability decide the rest of his life. His eyes, therefore, were fixed in a sort of agony upon the door through which the king must enter. Louis the Thirteenth appeared, walking fast. He was in hunting costume covered with dust, wearing large boots and holding a whip in his hand. At the first glance, D'Artagnan judged that the mind of the king was stormy. This disposition, visible as it was in his majesty, did not prevent the courtiers from ranging themselves along his pathway. In royal antechambers, it is worth more to be viewed with an angry eye than not to be seen at all. The three musketeers, therefore, did not hesitate to make a step forward. D'Artagnan, on the contrary, remained concealed behind them. But although the king knew Athos, Porthos, and Aramis personally, he passed before them without speaking or looking, indeed, as if he had never seen them before. As for Monsieur de Treville, when the eyes of the king fell upon him, he sustained the look with so much firmness that it was the king who dropped his eyes, after which his majesty, grumbling, entered his apartment. "'Matters go badly,' said Athos, smiling, "'and we shall not be made chevaliers of the order this time.' "'Wait here ten minutes,' said Monsieur de Treville, "'and, if at the expiration of ten minutes you do not see me come out, return to my hotel, for it will be useless for you to wait for me any longer.' The four young men waited ten minutes, a quarter of an hour, twenty minutes, and seeing that Monsieur de Treville did not return, went away very uneasy as to what was going to happen. Monsieur de Treville entered the king's cabinet boldly, and found his majesty in a very ill humor seated on an armchair, beating his boot with the handle of his whip. This, however, did not prevent his asking, with the greatest coolness, after his majesty's health. "'Bad, monsieur, bad!' replied the king. I am bored. This was, in fact, the worst complaint of Louis the Thirteenth, who would sometimes take one of his courtiers to a window and say, Monsieur so-and-so, let us weary ourselves together. How? Your majesty is bored? Have you not enjoyed the pleasures of the chase today? A fine pleasure indeed, monsieur. Upon my soul everything degenerates, and I don't know whether it is the game which leaves no scent, or the dogs that have no noses. We started a stag of ten branches. We chased him for six hours, and when he was near being taken, when St. Simon was already putting his horn to his mouth to sound the mort, crack! All the pack takes the wrong scent and sets off after a two-year older. I shall be obliged to give up hunting, as I have given up hawking. Ha! Huh. I am an unfortunate king, Monsieur de Treville. I had but one gerfalcon, and he died day before yesterday. Indeed, sire, I wholly comprehend your disappointment. The misfortune is great, but I think you still have a good number of falcons, sparrowhawks, and tiercels. And not a man to instruct them. Falconers are declining. I know no one but myself who is acquainted with the noble art of venery. After me it will all be over, and people will hunt with gins, snares, and traps. If I had but the time to train pupils! But there is the cardinal always at hand, who does not leave me a moment's repose, who talks to me about Spain, who talks to me about Austria, who talks to me about England. Ah! A propos of the cardinal, Monsieur de Treville, I am vexed with you. This was the chance at which Monsieur de Treville waited for the king. He knew the king of old, and he knew that all these complaints were but a preface, a sort of excitation to encourage himself, and that he now had come to his point at last. And in what have I been so unfortunate as to displease your majesty? asked Monsieur de Treville feigning the most profound astonishment. "'Is it thus you perform your charge, monsieur?' continued the king, without directly replying to de Treville's question. 
Is it for this I name you captain of my musketeers, that they should assassinate a man, disturb a whole quarter, and endeavor to set fire in Paris, without your saying a word? But yet, continued the king, undoubtedly my haste accuses you wrongfully. Without doubt the rioters are in prison, and you come to tell me justice is done. Sire, replied M. de Treville, calmly, on the contrary, I come to demand it of you. And against whom? cried the king. Against calumniators, said M. de Treville. Ah, this is something new, replied the king. Will you tell me that your three damned musketeers, Athos, Porthos, and Aramis, and your youngster from Béarn have not fallen like so many furies upon poor Bernajoux, and have not maltreated him in such a fashion that probably by this time he is dead? Will you tell me that they did not lay siege to the hotel of the Duc de la Tremoya, and that they did not endeavor to burn it? Which would not perhaps have been a great misfortune in time of war, seeing that it is nothing but a nest of Huguenots, but which is, in time of peace, a frightful example. Tell me, now, can you deny all this? And who told you this fine story, sire? asked Treville quietly. Who has told me this fine story, monsieur? Who should it be but he who watches while I sleep, who labors while I amuse myself, who conducts everything at home and abroad, in France as in Europe? Your majesty probably refers to God, said M. de Treville, for I know no one except God who can be so far above your majesty. No, monsieur, I speak of the prop of the state, of my only servant, of my only friend, of the cardinal. His eminence is not his holiness, sire. What do you mean by that, monsieur? That it is only the Pope who is infallible, and that this infallibility does not extend to cardinals. You mean to say that he deceives me? You mean to say that he betrays me? You accuse him, then? Come, speak, avow freely that you accuse him. No, sire, but I say that he deceives himself. I say that he is ill-informed. I say that he has hastily accused your majesty's musketeers, toward whom he is unjust, and that he has not obtained his information from good sources. The accusation comes from Monsieur de la Tremoya, from the duke himself. What do you say to that? I might answer, sire, that he is too deeply interested in the question to be a very impartial witness. But so far from that, sire, I know the duke to be a royal gentleman. I refer the matter to him, but upon one condition, sire. What? It is that your majesty will make him come here, will interrogate him yourself, tete a tete, without witnesses, and that I shall see your majesty as soon as you have seen the duke. What, then? You will bind yourself? cried the king. By what Monsieur de la Tremoya shall say? Yes, sire. You will accept his judgment? Undoubtedly. And you will submit to the reparation he may require? Certainly. La Chesnaya, said the king. La Chesnaya. Louis the Thirteenth's confidential valet, who never left the door, entered in reply to the call. La Chesnaya, said the king, let someone go instantly and find Monsieur de la Tremoya. I wish to speak with him this evening. Your Majesty gives me your word that you will not see anyone between Monsieur de la Tremoya and myself. Nobody, by the faith of a gentleman. Tomorrow, then, sire. Tomorrow, monsieur. At what o'clock, please, your majesty? At any hour you will. But in coming too early, I should be afraid of waking your majesty. Awaken me. Do you think I ever sleep, then? I sleep no longer, monsieur. 
I sometimes dream, that's all. Come, then, as early as you like, at seven o'clock. But beware, if you and your musketeers are guilty. If my musketeers are guilty, sire, the guilty shall be placed in your majesty's hands. Who will dispose of them at your good pleasure? Does your majesty require anything further? Speak, I am ready to obey. No, monsieur, no. I am not called Louis the Just without reason. Tomorrow, then, monsieur, tomorrow. Till then, God preserve your majesty. However ill the king might sleep, monsieur de Treville slept still worse. He had ordered his three musketeers and their companion to be with him at half-past six in the morning. He took them with him, without encouraging them or promising them anything, and without concealing from them that their luck, and even his own, depended upon the cast of the dice. Arrived at the foot of the back stairs, he desired them to wait. If the king was still irritated against them, they would depart without being seen. If the king consented to see them, they would only have to be called. On arriving at the king's private antechamber, M. de Treville found La Chesne, who informed him that they had not been able to find M. de la Tremoille on the preceding evening at his hotel, that he returned too late to present himself at the Louvre, that he had only that moment arrived, and that he was at that very hour with the king. This circumstance pleased M. de Treville much, as he thus became certain that no foreign suggestion could insinuate itself between M. de la Tremoille's testimony and himself. In fact, ten minutes had scarcely passed away when the door of the king's closet opened, and M. de Treville saw M. de la Tremoille come out. The duke came straight up to him and said, M. de Treville, his majesty has just sent for me in order to inquire respecting the circumstances which took place yesterday at my hotel. I have told him the truth, that is to say, that the fault lay with my people, and that I was ready to offer you my excuses. Since I have the good fortune to meet you, I beg you to receive them, and to hold me always as one of your friends. Monsieur the Duke, said Monsieur de Treville, I was so confident of your loyalty that I required no other defender before His Majesty than yourself. I find that I have not been mistaken, and I thank you that there is still one man in France of whom may be said without disappointment what I have said of you. That's well said, cried the king, who had heard all these compliments through the open door. Only tell him, Treville, since he wishes to be considered your friend, that I also wish to be one of his. But he neglects me. That is nearly three years since I have seen him, and that I never do see him unless I send for him. Tell him all this for me, for these are things which a king cannot say for himself. Thanks, sire, thanks, said the duke. But your majesty may be assured that it is not those— I do not speak of Monsieur de Treville, whom your majesty sees at all hours of the day that are most devoted to you. Ah, you have heard what I said. So much the better, duke, so much the better— said the king, advancing toward the door. Ah, it is you, Treville. Where are your musketeers? I told you the day before yesterday to bring them with you. Why have you not done so? They are below, sire, and with your permission, La Chesney will bid them come up. Yes, yes, let them come up immediately. It is nearly eight o'clock, and at nine I expect a visit. Go, Monsieur Duke, and return often. Come in, Treville. The duke saluted and retired. At the moment he opened the door, the three musketeers and D'Artagnan, conducted by La Chesney, appeared at the top of the staircase. "'Come in, my braves,' said the king. "'Come in. I am going to scold you.' The musketeers advanced, bowing, D'Artagnan following closely behind them. "'What the devil?' continued the king. Seven of his eminence guards place hors de combat by you for in two days. That's too many, gentlemen, too many. If you go on so, his eminence will be forced to renew his company in three weeks, and I to put the edicts in force in all their rigor. One now and then I don't say much about, but seven in two days. I repeat, 
It is too many. It is far too many. Therefore, sire, your majesty sees that they are come quite contrite and repentant to offer you their excuses. Quite contrite and repentant? Hem, said the king. I place no confidence in their hypocritical faces. In particular, there is one yonder of a Gascon look. Come hither, monsieur. D'Artagnan, who understood that it was to him this compliment was addressed, approached, assuming a most deprecating air. "'Why, you told me he was a young man. This is a boy, Treville, a mere boy. Do you mean to say that it was he who bestowed that severe thrust at Jussac? "'And those two equally fine thrusts at Bernajoux. "'Truly!' "'Without reckoning,' said Athos, that if he had not rescued me from the hands of Cahusac, I should not now have the honor of making my very humble reverence to your majesty. Why, he is a very devil, this Bernays, ventre saint gris, Monsieur de Treville, as the king my father would have said, but at this sort of work many doublets must be slashed and many swords broken. Now, Gascons are always poor, are they not? sire i can assert that they have hitherto discovered no gold mines in their mountains though the lord owes them this miracle in recompense for the manner in which they supported the pretensions of the king your father which is to say that the gascons made a king of me myself seeing that i am my father's son is it not treville well happily i don't say nay to it La Gesnay, go and see if by rummaging all my pockets you can find forty pistoles and if you can find them bring them to me and now let us see young man with your hand upon your conscience how did all this come to pass d'artagnan related the adventure of the preceding day in all its details how not having been able to sleep for the joy he felt in the expectation of seeing his majesty he had gone to his three friends three hours before the hour of audience, how they had gone together to the tennis court, and how upon the fear he had manifested lest he receive a ball in the face, he had been jeered at by Bernajoux, who had nearly paid for his jeer with his life, and Monsieur de la Tremoya, who had nothing to do with the matter with the loss of his hotel. "'This is all very well,' murmured the king. "'Yes.' This is just the account the duke gave me of the affair. A poor cardinal! Seven men in two days, and those of his very best. But that's quite enough, gentlemen. Please to understand, that's enough. You have taken your revenge for the Rue Farou, and even exceeded it. You ought to be satisfied. If your majesty is so, said Treville, we are oh yes i am added the king taking a handful of gold from la chesnay and putting it into the hand of d'artagnan here said he is a proof of my satisfaction at this epoch the ideas of pride which are in fashion in our days did not prevail a gentleman received from hand to hand money from the king and was not the least in the world humiliated d'artagnan put his forty pistoles into his pocket without any scruple on the contrary thanking his majesty greatly there said the king looking at a clock there now as it is half past eight you may retire for as i told you i expect someone at nine thanks for your devotedness gentlemen i may continue to rely upon it may i not oh sire cried the four companions with one voice we would allow ourselves to be cut to pieces in your majesty's service well well but keep whole that will be better and you will be more useful to me treville added the king in a low tone as the others were retiring as you have no room in the musketeers and as we have besides decided that a novitiate is necessary before entering that corps place this young man in the company of the guards of monsieur dessessart your brother-in-law oh par dieu treville i enjoy beforehand the face the cardinal will make he will be furious but i don't care i am doing what is right the king waved his hand to treville who
who left him and rejoined the musketeers whom he found sharing the forty pistoles with d'artagnan the cardinal as his majesty had said was really furious so furious that during eight days he absented himself from the king's gaming table this did not prevent the king from being as complacent to him as possible whenever he met him or from asking in the kindest tones well monsieur cardinal how fares it with that poor Jussac, uh, and that poor bernajou of yours end of chapter six recording by john van stan savannah georgia Chapter Seven of the D'Artagnan Romances, Volume One: The Three Musketeers by Alexandre Dumas, translated by William Robson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Interior of the Musketeers. When D'Artagnan was out of the Louvre and consulted his friends upon the use he had best make of his share of the forty pistoles, Athos advised him to order a good repast at the Palme de Pan, Porthos to engage a lackey and Aramis to provide himself with a suitable mistress. The repast was carried into effect that very day, and the lackey waited at table. The repast had been ordered by Athos, and the lackey furnished by Porthos. He was a Picard, whom the glorious musketeer had picked up on the bridge Tournelle, making rings and plashing in the water. Porthos pretended that this occupation was proof of a reflective and contemplative organization, and he had brought him away without any other recommendation. The noble carriage of this gentleman, for whom he believed himself to be engaged, had one Planchet. That was the name of the Picard. He felt a slight disappointment, however, when he saw that this place was already taken by a compeer named Mousqueton, and when Porthos signified to him that the state of his household, though great, would not support two servants, and that he must enter into the service of D'Artagnan. Nevertheless, when he waited at the dinner given by his master and saw him take out a handful of gold to pay for it, he believed his fortune made and returned thanks to heaven for having thrown him into the service of such a Croesus. He preserved this opinion even after the feast, with the remnants of which he repaired his own long abstinence. But when, in the evening, he made his master's bed, the chimeras of Planchet faded away. The bed was the only one in the apartment which consisted of an antechamber and a bedroom. Planchet slept in the antechamber upon a coverlet taken from the bed of D'Artagnan, and which D'Artagnan from that time made shift to do without. Athos, on his part, had a valet whom he had trained in his service in a thoroughly peculiar fashion, and who was named Grimaud. He was very taciturn, this worthy seigneur. Be it understood, we are speaking of Athos. During the five or six years that he had lived in the strictest intimacy with his companions, Porthos and Aramis, they could remember having often seen him smile, but had never heard him laugh. His words were brief and expressive, conveying all that was meant, and no more. No embellishments, no embroidery, no arabesques. His conversation was a matter of fact, without a single romance. Although Athos was scarcely thirty years old, and was of great personal beauty and intelligence of mind, no one knew whether he had ever had a mistress. He never spoke of women. He certainly did not prevent others from speaking of them before him, although it was easy to perceive that this kind of conversation, in which he only mingled by bitter words and misanthropic remarks, was very disagreeable to him. His reserve, his roughness, and his silence made almost an old man of him. He had then, in order not to disturb his habits, accustomed Grimaud to obey him upon a simple gesture or upon a simple movement of his lips. He never spoke to him except under the most extraordinary occasions. Sometimes Grimaud, who feared his master as he did fire, while entertaining a strong attachment to his person and a great veneration for his talents, believed he perfectly understood what he wanted, flew to execute the order received, and did precisely the contrary. Athos then shrugged his shoulders and, without putting himself in a passion, thrashed Grimaud. On these days he spoke a little. Porthos, as we have seen, had a character exactly opposite to that of Athos. He not only talked much, but he talked loudly, little caring, we must render him that justice, whether anybody listened to him or not. He talked for the pleasure of talking, and for the pleasure of hearing himself talk. He spoke upon all subjects except the sciences, alleging in this respect the inveterate hatred he had borne to scholars from his childhood. 
he had not so noble an air as athos and the commencement of their intimacy often rendered him unjust toward that gentleman whom he endeavored to eclipse by his splendid dress but with his simple musketeer's uniform and nothing but the manner in which he threw back his head and advanced his foot athos instantly took the place which was his due and consigned the ostentatious porthos to the second rank porthos consoled himself by filling the antechamber of monsieur de treville and the guard-room of the louvre with the accounts of his love scrapes after having passed from professional ladies to military ladies from the lawyer's dame to the baroness there was question of nothing less with porthos than a foreign princess who was enormously fond of him an old proverb says like master like man let us pass then from the valet of athos to the valet of porthos from grimaud to mousqueton mousqueton was a norman whose pacific name of boniface his master had changed into the infinitely more sonorous name of mousqueton he had entered the service of porthos upon condition that he should only be clothed and lodged though in a handsome manner but he claimed two hours a day to himself consecrated to an employment which would provide for his other wants porthos agreed to the bargain the thing suited him wonderfully well he had doublets cut out of his clothes and cast off cloaks for mousqueton and thanks to a very intelligent tailor who made his clothes look as good as new by turning them and whose wife was suspected of wishing to make porthos descend from his aristocratic habits mousqueton made a very good figure when attending on his master as for aramis of whom we believe we have sufficiently explained the character a character which like that of his companions we shall be able to follow in its development his lackey was called bazin thanks to the hopes which his master entertained of some day entering into orders he was always clothed in black as became the servant of a churchman he was a barachon thirty-five or forty years old mild peaceable sleek employing the leisure his master left him in the perusal of pious works providing rigorously for two a dinner of a few dishes but excellent for the rest he was dumb blind and deaf and of impeachable fidelity and now that we are acquainted superficially at least with the masters and the valets let us pass on to the dwellings occupied by each of them athos dwelt in the rue ferru within two steps of the luxembourg his apartment consisted of two small chambers very nicely fitted up in a furnished house the hostess of which still young and still really handsome cast tender glances uselessly at him some fragments of past splendor appeared here and there upon the walls of this modest lodging a sword for example richly embossed which belonged by its make to the times of francis i the hilt of which alone encrusted with precious stones might be worth two hundred pistoles and which nevertheless in his moments of greatest distress athos had never pledged or offered for sale it had long been an object of ambition for porthos porthos would have given ten years of his life to possess this sword one day when he had an appointment with the duchess he endeavored even to borrow it of athos athos without saying anything emptied his pockets got together all his jewels purses aguilette and gold chains and offered them all to porthos but as to the sword he said it was sealed to its place and should never quit it until its master should himself quit his lodgings in addition to the sword there was a portrait representing a nobleman of the time of henry the third dressed with the greatest elegance and who wore the order of the holy ghost and this portrait had certain resemblances of lines with athos certain family likenesses which indicated that this great noble a knight of the order of the king was his ancestor besides these a casket of magnificent gold work with the same arms as the sword and the portrait formed a middle ornament to the mantelpiece and assorted badly with the rest of the furniture athos always carried the key of his coffer about him but he one day opened it before porthos and porthos was convinced that this coffer contained nothing but letters and papers love letters and family papers no doubt porthos lived in an apartment large in size and of very sumptuous appearance in the rue de vieux colombier every time he passed with a friend before his windows at one of which mousqueton was sure to be placed in full livery porthos raised his head and his hand and said 
that is my abode but he was never to be found at home he never invited anybody to go up with him and no one could form an idea of what his sumptuous apartment contained in the shape of real riches as to aramis he dwelt in a little lodging composed of a boudoir an eating room and a bedroom which rooms situated as the others were on the ground floor looked out upon a little fresh green garden shady and impenetrable to the eyes of his neighbors with regard to d'artagnan we know how he was lodged and we have already made acquaintance with his lackey master planchet d'artagnan who was by nature very curious as people generally are who possess the genius of intrigue did all he could to make out who athos porthos and aramis really were for under these pseudonyms each of these young men concealed his family name athos in particular who a league away savored of nobility he addressed himself then to porthos to gain information respecting athos and aramis and to aramis in order to learn something of porthos unfortunately porthos knew nothing of the life of his silent companion but what revealed itself it was said athos had met with great crosses in love and that a frightful treachery had forever poisoned the life of this gallant man what could this treachery be all the world was ignorant of it as to porthos except his real name as was the case with those of his two comrades his life was very easily known vain and indiscreet it was as easy to see through him as through a crystal the only thing to mislead the investigator would have been belief in all the good things he said of himself with respect to aramis though having the air of having nothing secret about him he was a young fellow made up of mysteries answering little to questions put to him about others and having learned from him the report which prevailed concerning the success of the musketeers with the princess wished to gain a little insight into the amorous adventures of his interlocutor and you my dear companion said he you speak of the baronesses countesses and princesses of others pardieu i spoke of them because porthos talked of them himself because he had paraded all these fine things before me but be assured my dear monsieur d'artagnan that if i had obtained them from any other source or if they had been confided to me there exists no confessor more discreet than myself oh i don't doubt that replied d'artagnan but it seems to me that you are tolerably familiar with coats of arms a certain embroidered handkerchief for instance to which i owe the honor of your acquaintance this time aramis was not angry but assumed the most modest air and replied in a friendly tone my dear friend do not forget that i wish to belong to the church and that i avoid all mundane opportunities the handkerchief you saw had not been given to me but it had been forgotten and left at my house by one of my friends i was obliged to pick it up in order not to compromise him and the lady he loves as for myself i neither have nor desire to have a mistress following in that respect the very judicious example of athos who has none any more than i have but what the devil you are not a priest you are a musketeer a musketeer for a time my friend as the cardinal says a musketeer against my will but a churchman at heart believe me athos and porthos dragged me into this to occupy me i had at the moment of being ordained a little difficulty with but that would not interest you and i am taking up your valuable time not at all it interests me very much cried d'artagnan and at this moment i have absolutely nothing to do yes but i have my breviary to repeat answered aramis then some verses to compose which madame d'argion begged of me then i must go to the rue saint honore in order to purchase some rouge for madame de chevreuse so you see my dear friend that if you are not in a hurry i am very much in a hurry aramis held out his hand in a cordial manner to his young companion and took leave of him notwithstanding all the pains he took d'artagnan was un unable to learn any more concerning his three new-made friends he formed therefore the resolution of believing for the present all that was said of their past 
hoping for more certain and extended revelations in the future. In the meanwhile, he looked upon Athos as an Achilles, Porthos as an Ajax, and Aramis as a Joseph. As to the rest, the life of the four young friends was joyous enough. Athos played, and that as a rule, unfortunately. Nevertheless, he never borrowed a sou of his companions, although his purse was ever at their service. And when he had played upon honor, he always awakened his creditor by six o'clock the next morning to pay the debt of the preceding evening. Porthos had his fits. On the days when he won, he was insolent and ostentatious. If he lost, he disappeared completely for several days, after which he reappeared with a pale face and thinner person but with money in his purse. As to Aramis, he never played. He was the worst musketeer and the most unconvivial companion imaginable. He had always something or other to do, sometimes in the midst of dinner when every one, under the attraction of wine and in the warmth of conversation, believed they had two or three hours longer to enjoy themselves at table, Aramis looked at his watch, arose with a bland smile, and took leave of the company to go, as he said, to consult a casuist with whom he had an appointment. At other times he would return home to write a treatise, and requested his friends not to disturb him. At this Athos would smile with his charming, melancholy smile, which so became his noble countenance, and Porthos would drink, swearing that Aramis would never be anything but a village curé. Planchet, D'Artagnan's valet, supported his good fortune nobly. He received thirty sous per day, and for a month he returned to his lodgings gay as a chaffinch, and affable towards his master. When the wind of adversity began to blow upon the housekeeping of the Rue des Fossoyeurs, that is to say, when the forty pistoles of King Louis the Thirteenth were consumed, or nearly so, he commenced complaints which Athos thought nauseous, Porthos indecent, and Aramis ridiculous. Athos counseled D'Artagnan to dismiss the fellow. Porthos was of the opinion that he should give him a good thrashing first, and Aramis contented that a master should never attend to anything but the civilities paid to him. "'That is all very easy for you to say,' replied D'Artagnan. "'For you, Athos, who live like a dumb man with Grimald, who forbid him to speak, and consequently never exchange ill words with him. For you, Porthos, who carry matters in such a magnificent style, and are a god to your valet, Mousqueton. And for you, Aramis, who always, abstracted by your theological studies, inspire your servant, Bazin, a mild religious man with a profound respect. But for me, who am without any settled means and without resources, for me, who am neither a musketeer nor even a guardsman, what am I to do to inspire either the affection, the terror, or the respect in Planchet? This is serious, answered the three friends. It is a family affair. It is with valets as with wives. They must be placed at once upon the footing in which you wish them to remain. Reflect upon it. D'Artagnan did reflect and resolved to thrash Planchet provisionally, which he did with the conscientiousness that D'Artagnan carried into everything. After having well beaten him, he forbade him to leave his service without his permission. For, added he, the future cannot fail to mend. I inevitably look for better times. Your fortune is therefore made if you remain with me, and I am too good a master to allow you to miss such a chance by granting you the dismissal you require." This manner of acting roused much respect for D'Artagnan's policy among the musketeers. Planchet was equally seized with admiration and said no more about going away. The life of the four young men had become fraternal. D'Artagnan, who had no settled habits of his own as he came from his province into the midst of a world quite new to him, fell easily into the habits of his friends. They rose about eight o'clock in the winter, about six in the summer, and went to take the countersign and see how things went on at M. de Treville's. D'Artagnan, although he was not a musketeer, performed the duty of one with remarkable punctuality. He went on guard because he always kept company with whoever of his friends was on duty. He was well known at the Hotel of the Musketeers, where everyone considered him a good comrade. M. de Treville, who had appreciated him at the first glance and who bore him a real affection, never ceased recommending him to the king. On their side, the three musketeers were much attached to their young comrade. 
the friendship which united these four men, and the need they felt for seeing another three or four times a day, whether for dueling, business, or pleasure, caused them to be continually running after one another like shadows, and the inseparables were constantly to be met with seeking one another, from the Luxembourg to the Place saint Sulpice, or from the Rue de vieux Colombier to the Luxembourg. In the meanwhile, the promises of M. de Treville went on prosperously. One fine morning, the king commanded M. de Chevalier Deshart to admit D'Artagnan as a cadet in his company of guards. D'Artagnan, with a sigh, donned his uniform, which he would have exchanged for that of a musketeer at the expense of ten years of his existence. But M. de Treville promised this favor after a novitiate of two years, a novitiate which might besides be abridged if an opportunity should present itself for D'Artagnan to render the king any signal service, or to distinguish himself by some brilliant action. Upon this promise D'Artagnan withdrew, and the next day he began service. Then it became the turn of Athos, Porthos, and Aramis to mount guard with D'Artagnan when he was on duty. The company of Monsieur Le Chevalier de Cessart thus received four instead of one when it admitted D'Artagnan. End of chapter 7 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter 8 of the D'Artagnan Romances, Volume 1, The Three Musketeers, by Alexandre Dumas, translated by William Robson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 8. Concerning a Court Intrigue In the meantime, the forty pistoles of King Louis the Thirteenth, like all other things of this world, after having had a beginning, had an end, and after this end, our four companions began to be somewhat embarrassed. At first, Athos supported the association for a time with his own means. Porthos succeeded him, and thanks to one of those disappearances to which he was accustomed, he was able to provide for the wants of all for a fortnight. At last it became Aramis's turn, who performed it with a good grace, and who succeeded, as he said, by selling some theological books, and procuring a few pistoles. Then, as they had been accustomed to do, they had recourse to M. de Treville, who made some advances on their pay, but these advances could not go far with three musketeers who were already much in arrears, and a guardsman who as yet had no pay at all. At length, when they found they were likely to be really in want, they got together as a last effort eight or ten pistoles with which Porthos went to the gaming table. Unfortunately, he was in a bad vein. He lost all together with twenty-five pistoles for which he had given his word. Then the inconvenience became distress. The hungry friends, followed by their lackeys, were seen haunting the quays and guard-rooms, picking up among their friends abroad all the dinners they could meet with, for according to the advice of Aramis, it was prudent to sow repasts right and left in prosperity in order to reap a few in time of need. Athos was invited four times, and each time took his friends and their lackeys with him. Porthos had six occasions and contrived in the same manner that his friends should partake of them. Aramis had eight of them. He was a man, as must have been already perceived, who made but little noise, and yet was much sought after. As to D'Artagnan, who as yet knew nobody in the capital, he only found one chocolate breakfast at the house of a priest of his own province, and one dinner at the house of a cornet of the guards. He took his army to the priests, where they devoured as much provision as would have lasted him for two months, and to the Cornets, who performed wonders, but as Planchet said, "'People do not eat at once for all time, even when they eat a good deal.' D'Artagnan thus felt himself humiliated in having only procured one meal and a half for his companions, as the breakfast at the priests could only be counted as half a repast in return for the feasts which Athos, Porthos, and Aramis had procured him. He fancied himself a burden to the society, forgetting in his perfectly juvenile good faith that he had fed this society for a month, and he set his mind actively to work. He reflected that this coalition of four young, brave, enterprising, and active men ought to have some other object than swaggering walks, fencing lessons, and practical jokes more or less witty. In fact, four men such as they were, Four men devoted to one another from their purses to their lives. Four men always supporting one another, never yielding, 
executing singly or together the resolutions formed in common, four arms threatening the four cardinal points, or turning toward a single point, must inevitably either subterraneously in open day, by mining in the trench, by cunning or by force, open themselves away toward the object they wish to attain, however well it might be defended or however distant it may seem. The only thing that astonished D'Artagnan was that his friends had never thought of this. He was thinking by himself, and even seriously racking his brain to find a direction for this single force four times multiplied, with which he did not doubt, as with the lever for which Archimedes sought, they should succeed in moving the world when someone tapped gently at his door. D'Artagnan awakened Planchet and ordered him to open it. From this phrase, D'Artagnan awakened Planchet, the reader must not suppose it was night, for that day was hardly come. No, it had just struck four. Planchet, two hours before, had asked his master for some dinner, and he had answered him with the proverb, He who sleeps dines, and Planchet dined by sleeping. A man was introduced of simple mien, who had the appearance of a tradesman. Planchet, by way of dessert, would have liked to hear the conversation, but the citizen declared that, to D'Artagnan, what he had to say being important and confidential, he desired to be left alone with him. D'Artagnan dismissed Planchet and requested his visitor to be seated. There was a moment of silence, during which the two men looked at each other as if to make a preliminary acquaintance, after which D'Artagnan bowed as a sign that he listened. "'I have heard Monsieur D'Artagnan spoken of as a very brave young man,' said the citizen. "'And this reputation which he justly enjoys has decided me to confide a secret to him.' "'Speak, monsieur, speak,' said D'Artagnan, who instinctively scented something advantageous. The citizen made a fresh pause and continued, "'I have a wife who is seamstress to the queen, monsieur, and who is not deficient in either virtue or beauty. I was induced to marry her about three years ago, although she had but very little dowry, because monsieur Laporte, the queen's cloak-bearer, is her godfather and befriends her.' "'Well, monsieur?' asked D'Artagnan. "'Well,' resumed the citizen. "'Well, monsieur, my wife was abducted yesterday morning as she was coming out of her workroom.' "'And by whom was your wife abducted?' "'I know nothing surely, monsieur, but I suspect someone.' "'And who is the person whom you suspect?' A man who has pursued her a long time. The devil! But allow me to tell you, monsieur, continued the citizen, that I am convinced that there is less love than politics in all this. Less love than politics, replied D'Artagnan with a reflective air. And what do you suspect? I do not know whether I ought to tell you what I suspect. Monsieur, I beg you to observe that I ask you absolutely nothing. It is you who have come to me. It is you who have told me that you had a secret to confide in me. Act then as you think proper. There is still time to withdraw. No, monsieur, no. You appear to be an honest young man, and I will have confidence in you. I believe, then, that it is not on account of any intrigues of her own that my wife has been arrested, but because of those of a lady much greater than herself. Ha! <laughs> Can it be on the account of the amours of Madame de Boitracy? said D'Artagnan, wishing to have the air in the eyes of the citizen of being posted as to court affairs. Higher, monsieur, higher. Of Madame d'Aguillon? Still higher. Of Madame de Chevreuse? Of the... D'Artagnan checked himself. Yes, monsieur, replied the terrified citizen, 
in a tone so low that he was scarcely audible. "'And with whom?' "'With whom can it be, if not the Duke of—' "'The Duke of?' "'Yes, monsieur,' replied the citizen, giving a still fainter intonation to his voice. "'But how do you know all of this?' "'How do I know it?' "'Yes, how do you know it? No half-confidence, or you understand?' "'I know it from my wife, monsieur, from my wife herself.' "'Who learns it from whom?' "'From monsieur Laporte. Did I not tell you that she was the goddaughter of monsieur Laporte, the confidential man of the queen? Well, monsieur Laporte placed her near her majesty.' in order that our poor queen might at least have some one in whom she could place confidence abandoned as she is by the king watched as she is by the cardinal betrayed as she is by everybody ha <laughs> it begins to develop itself said d'artagnan now my wife came home four days ago monsieur one of her conditions was that she should come and see me twice a week for as i had the honor to tell you my wife loves me dearly my wife then came and confided to me that the queen at that very moment entertained great fears truly yes the cardinal as it appears pursues her and persecutes her more than ever he cannot pardon her the history of sarabond you know the history of sarabond pardon know it replied d'artagnan who knew nothing about it but who wished to appear to know everything that was going on so that now it is no longer hatred but vengeance indeed and the queen believes well what does the queen believe she believes that someone has written to the duke of buckingham in her name in the queen's name yes to make him come to paris and when once come to paris to draw him into some snare the devil but your wife monsieur what has she to do with all this her devotion to the queen is known they wish either to remove her from her mistress or to intimidate her in order to obtain her majesty's secrets or to seduce her and make use of her as a spy that is likely said d'artagnan but the man who has abducted her do you know him i have told you that i believe i know him his name i do not know that what i do know is that he is a creature of the cardinal his evil genius but you have seen him yes my wife pointed him out to me one day has he anything remarkable about him by which one may recognize him oh certainly he is a noble of very lofty carriage black hair swarthy complexion piercing eye white teeth and has a scar on his temple a scar on his temple cried d'artagnan and with that white teeth a piercing eye dark complexion black hair and haughty carriage why that's my man of mayong he is your man do you say yes yes but that has nothing to do with it no i i am wrong on the contrary that simplifies the matter greatly if your man is mine with one blow 
I shall obtain two revenges. That's all. But where to find this man? I know not. Have you no information as to his abiding place? None. One day, as I was conveying my wife back to the Louvre, he was coming out as she was going in, and she showed him to me. The devil! The devil! murmured D'Artagnan. All this is vague enough. From whom have you learned of the abduction of your wife? From Monsieur Laporte. Did he give you any details? He knew none himself. And you have learned nothing from any other quarter? Yes, I have received... What? I fear I am committing a great imprudence. You always come back to that, but I must make you see this time that it is too late to retreat. I do not retreat. Mon Dieu! cried the citizen, swearing in order to rouse his courage. Besides, by the faith of Bonacieux. You call yourself Bonacieux? interrupted D'Artagnan. Yes, that is my name. You said then, by the word of Bonacieux. Pardon me for interrupting you, but it appears to me that that name is familiar to me. Possibly, monsieur, I am your landlord. Ha! <laughs> said D'Artagnan, half rising and bowing. You are my landlord? Yes, monsieur, yes. And as it is three months since you have been here, and though distracted as you must be in your important occupations, you have forgotten to pay me my rent. As I say, I have not tormented you a single instant. I thought you would appreciate my delicacy. How can it be otherwise, my dear Bonacieux? replied D'Artagnan. Trust me, I am fully grateful for such unparalleled conduct. And if, as I told you, I can be of any service to you. I believe you, monsieur, I believe you. And as I was about to say, by the word of Bonacieux, I have confidence in you. Finish, then, what you were about to say. The citizen took a paper from his pocket and presented it to D'Artagnan. A letter, said the young man, which I received this morning. D'Artagnan opened it and as the day was beginning to decline, he approached the window to read it. The citizen followed him. "'Do not seek your wife,' read D'Artagnan. "'She will be restored to you, and there is no longer occasion for her. If you make a single step to find her, you are lost.' "'That's pretty positive,' continued D'Artagnan. "'But after all, it is but a menace.' Yes, but that menace terrifies me. I am not a fighting man at all, monsieur, and I am afraid of the Bastille. Huh, oh, said D'Artagnan, I have no greater regard for the Bastille than you. If it were nothing but a sword thrust, why then? I have counted upon you on this occasion, monsieur. Yes? seeing you constantly surrounded by musketeers of a very superb appearance and knowing that these musketeers belonged to monsieur de treville and were consequently enemies of the cardinal i thought that you and your friends while rendering justice to your poor queen would be pleased to play his eminence an ill turn without doubt and then I have thought that considering three months' lodging, about which I have said nothing— Yes, yes, you have already given me that reason, and I find it excellent. Reckoning still further that as long as you do me the honor to remain in my house, I shall never speak to you about rent. Very kind. And adding to this— 
if there need be of it, meaning to offer you fifty pistoles, if against all probability you should be short at the present moment. Admirable! You are rich, then, my dear Monsieur Bonacieux? I am comfortably off, Monsieur, that's all. I have scraped together some such things as an income of two or three thousand crowns in the haberdashery business, but more particularly in venturing some funds in the last voyage of the celebrated navigator Jean Moquet. So that you understand, monsieur. But, cried the citizen. What? demanded D'Artagnan. Whom do I see yonder? Where? In the street, facing your window, in the embrasure of that door, a man wrapped in a cloak. It is he, cried D'Artagnan and the citizen at the same time, each having recognized this man. Ha! <laughs> this time, cried D'Artagnan, springing to his sword, this time he will not escape me. Drawing his sword from its scabbard, he rushed out of the apartment. On the staircase he met Athos and Porthos, who were coming to see him. They separated, and D'Artagnan rushed between them like a dart. Ha! Where are you going? cried the two musketeers in a breath. The man of Meung, replied D'Artagnan, and disappeared. D'Artagnan had more than once related to his friends his adventure with the stranger, as well as the apparition of the beautiful foreigner, to whom this man had confided some important missive. The opinion of Athos was that D'Artagnan had lost his letter in the skirmish. A gentleman, in his opinion, and according to D'Artagnan's portrait of him, the stranger must be a gentleman, would be incapable of the baseness of stealing a letter. Porthos saw nothing in all this but a love-meeting given by a lady to a cavalier or by a cavalier to a lady, which had been disturbed by the presence of D'Artagnan and his yellow horse. Aramis said that as these sorts of affairs were mysterious, it was better not to fathom them. They understood then, from the few words which escaped from D'Artagnan, what affair was in hand, and as they thought that overtaking this man or losing sight of him, D'Artagnan would return to his rooms, they kept on their way. When they entered D'Artagnan's chamber it was empty, the landlord dreading the consequences of the encounter which was doubtless about to take place between the young man and the stranger, had, consistent with the character he had given himself, judged it prudent to decamp. End of chapter 8 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia